Hello everybody. At the onset, let me thank the director of Science City Kolkata and National Council of Science Museums, Government of India, for the opportunity to speak today with all of you. And I also thank everybody who is watching this video or this lecture or who has just joined online to listen to this lecture. Uh, this is my experience as an art scientist of how we should ensure sustainable use of Earth's natural resources while not compromising the biodiversity. And the story that I'm going to share today is about the Bhagjan story, and I'll talk about it as I go ahead. The world population is approximately 7.9 billion as I speak today, and therefore it is becoming increasingly challenging for sustainable management of our dynamic planet because of the increasing human pressure. And as a result, the natural resources are becoming uh, less and less. One of the biggest challenges that we face is the food security. And as a result, many of the uh, biodiversity rich regions or biodiversity rich waterscapes and landscapes are being converted uh, for the purpose of securing food to sustain the huge population that we have globally. And of course, uh, when we have such huge population, there will be a demand for energy, there will be demand for resources, the gadgets that we use, mobile phones, laptops, you know, televisions. Uh, everything requires energy and where from do we get it? Uh, it is rather impossible to completely depend on renewable energy, but eventually that's what our target is in the long run. So on short term basis, some of the non-renewable resources are being used all across the planet. And that is also the case for India. India has a very huge population, more than a billion uh, people we have in India. and. Uh, we have a very young dynamic generation uh, where there's a very need or there's an urge for the use of energy and also to be connected to the other parts of the world and therefore uh, India's economy is also expanding at a very fast rate and hence there's a huge need of uh, resources and particularly energy is one area where India is consuming at a much faster rate after China. And as a result, uh, we need to ensure that, you know, while we use the energy resources, but we also take into account how can we limit the loss of biodiversity. One of the biggest uh, resources that in India we have, at least, is the natural gas reserves. And natural gas actually acts as a reliable source of energy uh, in India. And here is a nice map showing where you can find some of the natural gas uh, reserves, particularly the gas hydrates. And I want to draw your attention to the northeast part of India, particularly in the state of Assam, which has a huge deposit of uh, gas hydrates, particularly along the Brahmaputra Basin. So if I look at this area, the Dibrugarh, Tinsukia, particularly this sector, there's huge resources of gas hydrates are there, and these are located along the flood plains of the Brahmaputra River. So Assam is actually a self-sustaining uh, state where it utilizes its own energy resources and sustains its activities. Not only that, it actually uh, transports 
the access of the resources into the national uh, distribution network or even into the national grid, for example, power grid. So gas hybrids uh, are being very effectively uh, you know, explored and the gas that comes out of this exploration process is used for different purposes, including for you know uh, human consumption, such as for example the gas that we use for cooking on a daily basis, or even the power that we use to recharge our cell phone. So in the two districts that I showed to you, for example, Dibrugar and Tinsukia, particularly Tinsukia in this area of Tinsukia, you can see that there is uh, there are a lot of wells are there which are being explored. Uh, for uh, gases and one of such wells is the Bagjan well number five. So the area of the well is Bagjan and there the well number five is very, very productive. It has huge reserves of uh, gas hydrates and has been explored and utilized. And the oil company actually takes those gas hydrates out and then they connect it to the national grid. And here you can see Tinsukia and here you can see the Dibrugar. Of course, you can see the river, the uh, river iron floodplains that is flowing across both the areas. And uh, I want to also want to draw attention to the national park, which is here, which is called the Dibru Saikawa National Park. So typically, this is how uh, a whale would look like, you know, the uh the gas hydrates are being taken out from from quite a de depth 2000 meters to 4000 meters and it's a very challenging engineering challenge and also an engineering marvel to some extent and this then it is being connected to the main pipeline and and of course is being transported and then processed for different purposes so the well five of bagjan in tinsuki is very very productive and has been operational for some time now so uh, what happened is if you look at that area this area is also a biodiversity hotspot why because it sits in the foothills of the himalayas and one of the most important biodiversity hotspots surrounding the well bagjan 5 is motapang maguri wetland this is an important bird and biodiversity area uh, more than 110 species of birds have been found and around eight species are threatened so it's a very very important uh, Boarding uh, area and a hotspot of biodiversity, also very rich in aquatic biodiversity, and also sustain the local economy because this particular wetland has huge um, uh, fishery resources. Now, Motapang Maguri wetland has become recently famous uh, because of the uh, you know uh, findings of uh, mandarin duck you know, if you go to the newspaper you will see that there has been a sighting of, Motap uh, of mandarin duck in uh, motapang maguri wetland and it has been sighted after 100 years if i am not wrong besides that there is as i said to you there is the dibdu saikoa national park uh, this is a very biodiversity rich region and of course this national park is famous for the hollow gibbon uh, if you look, you will know about hollow gibbon. This is one of the refugees of uh, hollow gibbon found in this uh, national park and of course surrounding the Bagjan region. Uh, there are a lot of other biodiversity uh, areas or zones uh, surrounding this well. Uh, but I also want to draw your attention to that besides there are grasslands are there, but there are a lot of tea gardens are there. So, of course, there's an economic side is there. And as I said to you before, a uh, substantial po local population is dependent on the rivers, uh, on the on the wetland for, for their uh, daily uh, activities. And of course, the fishing is one of the biggest uh, activities that happens in this area. Now, what happened is on 27th of May, during our routine uh, repairing of, of the well five, a blowout happened. And this even happened on 27th of May 2020. And as a result, uh, the uh, gas hydrate started to come out. The gas started to come out because there's a change in the pressure. And uh, there was gradual release of volatile condensates. And the gas hydrates were coming out. And the pressure was about 4,000 pounds per square inch. So you can imagine how much intensity of the hydrates are coming out is essentially in a very simple way if a jet plane just hits you know the amount of uh, the heat that it can generate so that that that's what you're looking at essentially so the routine maintenance led to this you know a, a technical flaw and as a result the gas started to leak out 
Now, obviously, the oil company which was working there, they start immediately started to uh, fix the problem. But uh, during the course of time, what happened is on 9 June of 2020, during the fixing the problem, actually the hydrate uh, caught fire and there's a huge explosion uh, in and around the well five of the Bhagjan. And you can see in this photo, the entire, uh, you know, the trees and, and whatever the uh, terrestrial vegetation that were there have absolutely got burnt out almost within one to two kilometers uh, radius of the well. So uh, immediately uh, we had an opportunity to actually go and figure out what kind of damages that had happened uh, between these two events. So that is the 27th May event when the gases started to come out, the condensates started to come out because these condensates started to deposit on the vegetation and of course uh, on 9 june 2020 uh, there was this fire and please recall all these events were happening when in last year corona was in full force not only in india but globally so we went down there and we started to look at the damages uh, the kind of dam immediate damages as a result of the explosion of the well and we use state of the art approaches. So here is one photo where we are actually trying to assess how much hydrocarbon have been deposited or in and around the well five because there are a lot of grasslands are there, terrestrial vegetations are there. The periphery of the Maguri Motapong wetland is also there. And you can see that how prominent this fire was of the well five that this is one shot showing from one end of the motapang maguri wetland and clearly visible you can see that the fumes are going up and these fumes are nothing but con condensers and these condensers would be depositing on the wetland which could have uh, a long short term and long term effects on the biodiversity uh, one of the thing that became very very clear was you can clearly see that after the fire lot of the the grasslands got burnt out or a lot of the leaves of the of the grasslands you know they got wilted you can clearly see out here and please see at the background the the foothills of the himalayas very clearly so so the damage was uh, quite apparent and uh, this damage was not just restricted to these wetlands but it also expanded towards the tea plantation and you know a large population in that area is dependent on, on the tea plantation for their employment and livelihood so we started to uh, look at uh, the the kind of damages that have been going on so use a lot of different type of approaches biology chemistry physics uh, we also did, uh, did atmospheric science measurements uh, and tried to understand uh, what is the effect of those condensates on that was coming out continuously from those wells and here is a nice uh, image you can see clearly that the hydrocarbons have been deposited and a thick layer has formed this is one image showing uh, on the effect of the oil floating basically the hydrocarbons are floating on the surface water of the uh, motapang maguri wetland and these are all surrounding this aquatic vegetation so when oil starts to float obviously they will prevent the gaseous exchanges which means that the biodiversity in the water the aquatic biodiversity will be affected including fish population particularly the fish larva which is very very important uh, for in the Maguri Motapang for maintaining the traffic balance and also from the perspective of the social economics of the region. Uh, so here you can see that even on a daily basis after 9 June that the fume intensity started to change. So the, so the condensate actually started to spread more here and there depending upon the direction of the wind, what was the air temperature, so many other factors started to contribute to it. And we continue to measure those sites very periodically and here you can see where we are measuring the oxygen concentration of the water and you can see that the oxygen is 1.5 uh, so actually this is really you know a, a condition called is hypoxia so hardly there is any oxygen is there and i wanted to point out that all these surfaces were very very hot because the entire two kilometer radius of the well which got completely burnt out so much hydrocarbon uh, residues were there and of course the burning there that also created a lot of heat uh, within the zone and the apparent loss of biodiversity was visible so for example here you can see one photo where the fish biodiversity was very badly affected 
uh, here is another nice example where you can see the mollusk shells completely crumble. So that means this temperature must have gone beyond 200, 300 degrees Celsius for the shells to crumble in this way. So it tells you how much uh, heat was generated when the fire was uh, got caught on 9th June of 2020. And this is a very, uh, I would say, a, a momentous photograph in some ways. It shows you that, you know, uh, you know, people who used to live here, you know, see just the bicycle, what is the condition of it is. It is completely mangled because of the heat. The house and everything is completely mangled. There used to be a uh, banana plantation or out at the background. Everything completely got burned out. And this is approximately uh, less than a kilometer away from the uh, well five of the Bhagjan, which caught fire on 9th of June. So, so the damages were apparent and we continue to measure it but not everything could be said was negative during the june time when we were, when we started to do the assessment we also found that the ecosystem was showing signs of resilience or recovery this is one example where we can see that the seedlings were coming out in the month of june in the area where entire grasslands got burnt out but the seedlings are coming out so actually ecosystems are far more resilient and they are trying to overcome uh, these habitats are trying to overcome the damage that was caused by 27th May and 9th June 2020 even. And we again went back after a few months in December. So on 3rd of December 2020, the fire was finally doused off. The capping of the well happened and the well was, uh, I would say, abundant. And uh, when we went back in after that, immediately after 3rd June 2020, we we started to look back at the ecosystem more carefully. And here is a nice image, which compared image, it shows a, a grassland which is burnt out and the, and the tree is completely in, looks like burnt out. The same place, when you go back in December 2020, the tree is back with a lot of leaves. So, so, so rejuvenation and the grasslands have rejuvenated. So the ecosystem was showing apparent signs of recovery but if we look very carefully in the closest proximity where the well actually caught the fire that is less than 500 meters everything was burnt out and there's no sign of recovery even after six months okay now you must be wondering why it took six months for the well to be capped the reason was after june there was heavy rainfall and you know flooding happened for three months so actually the capping event could not be taken into place and ultimately it took almost two months for the experts to bring it bring the fire under control and then to cap the uh, source of the gas hydrate uh, but we also saw that there were signs of biodiversity recovery in December 2020. So as I said to you, we're seeing a lot of plants that were started to grow up. So the, the original uh, vegetational pattern was starting to show up in this area. But not all was good, I must say. There were persistence of signatures of gas explosion. So the residues of the hydrocarbons were found. So in this case here, you can see that the plants have died out, but the hydrocarbons have accumulated around the plants. So some plants have the capacity to bioaccumulate uh, different types of pollutants, including hydrocarbons. So, so that means that the sites were still contaminated. And here is another nice example where you can see that the uh, water masses were still contaminated with hydrocarbons, but the vegetations were showing signs of recovery. Uh, one of the interesting features that we saw is in June, or we observed is that livelihood had resumed by that time. People have adapted themselves to these changes and the normal daily activity that used to happen before 27th May, you know, it continued in course of time. And it, for example, fishing is a very important component that resumed that kept on happening. Uh, and uh, so actually people were showing also signs of resilience along with the ecosystem. So what we have learned from this, I think the message that goes out from this is that when we want to use the natural resources, we want to utilize the natural resources, we also need to take into account the area where these resources are found. If, it, if these are biodiversity hotspot, then of course, the utilization of the natural resources must happen in a sustainable way. And I think the, the Bhagjan, yeah, well, uh, I would say that the gas leak and then the burning and then again the uh, capping of the gas and, and abundant clearly shows that, you know, you that there a choice has to be made and the choice is whether uh, uh, sustainability of the planet 
is more important or whether uh, growth of economy or whether utilization of the natural resources become very important and this is something it's a very very hard choice in a dynamic country like india but nevertheless i think what has happened is post the bagjan uh, event i think there are now checks and balances in place to actually figure out how uh, how we can balance and utilize the natural resources without compromising or without compromising the biodiversity or rather i should say how we can limit biodiversity loss at the same time we can utilize the natural resources such as the gases that are there in the hydrates of the region and i think uh, one of the other interesting aspect that we are continuing to work is we are trying to understand how long does it take for resilient ecosystems to actually uh, recover in course of time and this kind of event which happened abruptly but is very very strong how does ecosystem respond to it so we are continuing our work in, in this area i did not show many of the data but i would welcome uh, if you have any questions if you have any suggestions any clarification feel free to write to me to my email address pbhaduri at isercoal.ac.in and thank you all very much and I look forward to hearing from all of you. Thank you again.